Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome. Could I ask folks to say hello while I'm giving people a couple more minutes to log in just to see where you're all from? Don't hesitate to use the chat. We will be using the chat for the links for your CU form so you can put your three keywords for the form. So please make sure that you have access to the chat, but if for any reason you do not, I will also let you know what my email is and you can email me that way. Hello from Folkestone. Hello from the Isle of Wight, London, Hampshire. Oh, dear, oh, the Michigan, USA. All right. Belfast, Croatia. Wow, wow, wow. I'm always really glad to hear um, that we have a proper reach out in the world. That's always, always encouraging. Hello from Surrey, I see. Cardiff, oh, hello, Wales. All right. Connecticut, oh my, oh my, hello. So many folks and so many familiar names as well. Hello to all of you. Okay. I am recording the session. Good. Um, this will go on YouTube. So hello uh, for those of you who do not know me. I'm Thanos Vostanis. I'm a lecturer at the, the Teaser Center where we offer two master courses in applied behavior analysis and in positive behavior support. Uh, courses that are verified by Applied Behavior Analysis International if you want to become board certified behavior analysts. Or courses that are verified by the UK Society for Behavior Analysis if you want to become UKBA certs, which is the UK equivalent of BCBAs now. This uh, seminar or talk is part of our uh, work to disseminate good practice in uh, ABA, PBS, and the related subfields of behavior analysis. And that's why we invite knowledgeable uh, colleagues like Courtney uh, to talk about their excellent work. Now, this Art Center also offers opportunities for PhDs, so please do make sure you access our website. We were recently advertising a fully funded PhD scholarship. We have social media. You can find us on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook. Um, we, you cannot find us on Instagram yet, although my students keep telling me that that's a grave error and whether we should have an Instagram and a TikTok account, which uh, you know I, I always struggle with being not very fluent with all that. Um, and we have a peer review journal. We call it Tizard Learning Disability Review. It is a proper peer review journal with an impact factor focused on individuals with an intellectual disability, or as we call it in the UK, with a learning disability. So we always encourage colleagues to submit their work, even if it's case studies or opinion pieces or policy reviews. It's a practitioner focused journal, so do not hesitate to share your good work so that other colleagues of ours can access it. In terms of house rules, I will deliver three keywords today and you would be expected to submit those at the end. I will share a link to a Microsoft form. You add your keywords there along with all your details and we will deliver a complimentary CU or CPD. So make sure that you keep track of those keywords as I uh, present them throughout the session. And you also need to monitor the chat at the end of the session because that's where I will put the link to the form. Please make sure you click on the link before we conclude because if we conclude and the chat uh, and the team's uh, session finishes, you might not have access to the chat. So when I put that link, make sure you click on it so it opens up in your browser so you can access it. All right, enough plugging. We welcome Courtney Tarbox today to talk to us about kind extinction. Courtney, thank you very, very much for joining us. Uh, I always like to give the opportunity to our speakers to just start by saying what are they currently working on and then take it away and I'll be here monitoring things on my end and helping out in the background. All right. Thank you so much, Thanos. And I just wanted to to thank you for the invitation to be here today. Um, it's it's a privilege and and also for everyone that's attending um, live. I know for many of you, it's the, the end of a Monday, possibly a long work day. So I really appreciate you showing up. Um, current work. Well, let's see. I'm I'm the chief clinical officer at First Steps for Kids, 
Um, we're an ABA provider in California, in the US. Um, we have five offices, so medium-ish sized organization, primarily working with um, young kids providing behavior analytic services. Um, so I'm I'm a practitioner, and so it's exciting for me to contribute to the research um, in, in what I hope is a very practical way. Um, and that's sort of what, what I'm continuing to work on now, primarily as a practitioner, but also um, we have a few treatment evaluations currently um, that we're working on to to really look at our procedures and um, how we we can be implementing all that we do in the most compassionate way possible. Um, so looking at um, ascent as well as uh, we have a protocol right now where we're um, kind of Im embedding uh, acceptance and commitment training or ACT on top of uh, some current procedures to see if that can be, uh, you know, sprinkled on top to make our, our interventions a bit more compassionate while still being as effective as we possibly can. Um, so yeah, today that I'm going to be talking. That sounds super exciting. Yeah, it's, it's a lot that. of fun. Um, Good. And, and today I'm going to be talking about um, a recent paper that was published in Behavior Analysis and Practice, I think over the summer, um, titled Kind Extinction, um, a, a Procedural Modification on Traditional Extinction. Um, and I'm trying to, I'm going to try to leave time at the end for questions, but then Thanos, if, if you, you know, find it better to interrupt me with questions along the way, feel, feel free. I welcome whatever works best. So let's get started. You, Somehow I muted, muted myself. Yourself. Somehow yes. I muted myself as advancing uh, slides. <laughs> but you can see the That's slides all right. We can hear right you now. now. Okay. Yes, we can. Yes. Okay. Um, I I just wanted to to quickly orient us um, to to our values and 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 who we hope to be as um, service providers, clinicians, implementing ABA each day with the learners that we have the privilege to work with. Um, and just reflect on who who we want to be um, as behavior analysts, but but more importantly as humans working with other humans. And um, what do we want our science to be known for? Uh, I I think it's pretty safe to assume that maybe this uh, is a picture of who who we hope to be and where our hearts are as behavior analysts. Um, and yet. Um, if we're open to hearing some of the criticism that some of our autistic learners that are now adults um, are saying about ABA, this this may be how some of our clients experience our services at times, or maybe some of our procedures, um, and how some of the other stakeholders view our field, those outside of ABA. And if we we reflect on our ethics code and refer back to that as we're doing our daily work, we know that we have a responsibility to be using the least restrictive procedures possible, to minimize the use of any physical guidance, and to treat others with compassion. Um, so that, that's a fairly recent addition um, but to, to our ethics code, but really important um, to make sure that, like, maybe above all else, that we're treating others with compassion. And this does not mean that we need to compromise the effectiveness of what we do, um, but it does mean that we need to be keeping ourselves accountable for also doing this. And so what do we mean by compassion? Um, as we move toward a more compassionate practice, um, it's important to have our clear definitions. We love definitions as behavior analysts and so operationally defining what, what we're talking about. Um, so Taylor LeBlanc and Nosik back in 2019 gave us a pretty good definition um, and they, they described compassion as converting empathy into behavior aimed at the alleviation of suffering or distress. Um, and I do think it's important um, to note that although um, I, I work with learners with autism, autistic individuals, as I'm sure many of you do as well. Um, and so the implication here is not that um, having a diagnosis of autism equates to suffering or distress, 
but but even more simply and more broadly that that's part of the human experience it's kind of the tax of being human that we are going to have moments of suffering and distress and so if we can engage in compassionate behavior then doing that perspective taking and first engaging in empathy to um, think about what that other's experience may be in a given moment and then to really turn that into action, into overt behavior of what can we do in that moment to be more compassionate and reflect empathy in our behavior to minimize some of that distress. Um, and then I think you had uh, Dr. Anna Linehan um, on last month, um, and in one of her recent articles, um, they described or extended that definition um, to describe compassion as behavior maintained by the removal, mitigation, or prevention of distress for others. And that it's a really great article, and they also do um, a great job describing what genuine assent can be described as and analyzed by. Um, so I really recommend that article. Um, and then in another recent article um, with Christine Rodriguez that we put out, I forget when this one is recent as well, but really looking at a compassionate framework for behavior um, behavior analysis. And, and we um, propose that as behavior analysts, um, it's our responsibility to minimize sources of negative reinforcement, punishment, and extinction. And then conversely, really make sure that we're maximizing sources of positive reinforcement. And then that really aligns with the, the prior two definitions. And to really just make sure that we're continually assessing our behavior as we interact with the learners that we interact with every day um, to see if we are engaging in um, as compassionate of behavior as possible while implementing our interventions. So we probably don't need this slide, but just as a reminder, our, our definition um, for extinction as a procedure um, is that this occurs when reinforcement of a previously reinforced behavior is discontinued. And as a result, the frequency of that behavior decreases in the future. So nothing necessarily like non or un, <laughs> not compassionate about that um, within the technical definition of extinction. Um, and yet, practically speaking, when we implement extinction as an intervention, um, put simply, traditional extinction may not look kind to others um, when it's being implemented, and most importantly to the learners that we work with um, when it's being implemented. Um, I've, I've certainly heard the feedback from um, many that extinction can feel cold and it can feel like we're ignoring the person rather than the behavior. Um, and we know that extinction should be implemented functionally. Um, and yet somewhere along the way, uh, a lot of us learned that regardless of function, when implementing extinction, we should also kind of withhold attention and maybe make sure we're not shaping up that function. Um, and again, if we think about the experience of the learner and reflecting on what compassion means, um, what what's going on there? And are we doing our best to minimize any um, distress in that moment that they may be experiencing? Um, we know some of the side effects of extinction and kind of the um, emotional responding that may occur. And if we sort of throw away a lot of our technical language and just really think about what that means for the human being that we're interacting with, are we doing our best to minimize some of the distress in that moment? Um, I remember as a, as a young behavior analyst that uh, like working through an extinction burst sort of felt like a badge of honor. Um, and, and I will say now that like I, I feel pretty embarrassed about that and that um, I sort of uh, now feel the opposite when I see an escalation in behavior when implementing extinction that it that it hurts and that 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 should be the case that it shouldn't be something that we feel comfortable with, um, but instead something we reflect on in the moment and see if there's a way to be effective while also being kind and maybe compassionate in that moment. And so what if we could be just as effective, right? We don't want to sacrifice our science 
um, and also create a context where the learner feels more supported and therefore maybe feels more safe and willing to engage. And so being kind and practicing compassion do not need to be mutually exclusive with being effective. Um, and we need to, um, we're ethically bound to reflect on our procedures and make sure that we're engaging compassionately and maybe make adjustments to them to reflect that um, so that we're respecting our learners' dignity and that we're able to build a strong rapport with them and then even maybe reflect that to the other stakeholders and get more buy-in across the board and show everyone that this is where our hearts are and we're reflecting that within our procedures while still being effective. So on to kind extinction. Um, this is my youngest daughter when she was quite young, uh, Margot. And um, I include this because really she was the context for the idea for kind extinction um, and just the catalyst of this idea um, several, several years ago. She'd actually just turned nine. Um, I'm a practitioner, I said. It took me a while to write all of this up. <laughs> um, and so she she's she's a feisty little one and really um, can be fiery at times. And I think she was about three when one evening, I think it was like time to brush her teeth or something like that. And she was not having it and threw herself on the ground, big old tantrum and, and um, did not want to go brush her teeth. Um, and and I, I remember in that moment kind of like, feeling that like push and pull of like, do I do what I know is behaviorally sound and follow through and make sure that she is brushing her teeth? Um, or do I get to be mom in this moment and scoop her up, give her a hug, uh, let her know that like she's okay and I'm there, there with her? Um, and I remember that evening talking uh, with, with my husband and um, like there was this there was this distinct moment where I was like, why do we feel like we have to choose one or the other? How can we show up and show um, our daughter or or like perhaps those that we're working with that we care and that we're there to support them and be there next to them while also um, implementing extinction or following through like she she did need to brush her teeth that night. And is there a way to do to do both? Um, and then sort of like the second wave realization that really stung was um, why did it take a moment with my daughter to have me reflect on this and really um, prioritize the need to do both when I'm working with young learners every single day implementing extinction. Um, so that was the the catalyst uh, for for this study. It was a treatment evaluation that we did with um, for young autistic learners um, to okay. really look at. Oh. If, before you move on and talk about the study, just to deliver the first keyword, sorry to interrupt you. Folks, the first keyword for your CEU is kind. The first keyword for your CEU is kind. As in be kind, okay? All right, thanks, Courtney, take it away. As in kind extinction. <laughs> Here we go. Um, so what what we set out to to look at was just that was how can we implement function based extinction while also being um, kind, um, whatever that may look like for an individual learner. Um, and so our with within our procedures, um, we we implemented uh, what we found via uh, we did the PFA for for the learners was that. Uh, there was a tangible as well as um, escape function to to the behaviors we were looking at. And so implementing um, tangible and escape extinction while also offering some form of vocal um, and or physical comfort. And so it's important to note that these were offered, not forced. Um, and and so some just some examples of of what that looked like was just getting down to the the kids level offering them a quick hug or offering to rub their back um helping them to state what the observable emotion looked to be um 
and labeling the EO kind of the why for why they were upset, why they looked to be upset, and just making some sort of empathetic statement. Um, and uh, again, kindness was individualized, which actually sounds really silly and probably obvious, but this took some learning, was that there was not a one size fit approach to this. And so for um, one one little guy, like I remember just going and rubbing his back when he was really upset, and then that made him more upset. And so we quickly learned and included that within our procedural definitions that um, our offer of kindness um, we, we needed to make sure that that, that did not um, add to any increased escalation in the moment, but that it uh, uh, ideally lessened the, the escalation. But but if in the moment the um, decrease was not evident, that it at least did not increase the upset that we were observing. So we used um, just uh, tangibles or um, offers of vocal or physical comfort that were um, observed to function as reinforcers in the learner's history. So just stuff that we knew the kids liked, uh, but that were functionally arbitrary in that moment based on the function that we had observed to be um, the case for the, the target behavior. And again, they were offered, not forced, and they did not worsen the emotional responding in the moment. So here's um, one visual, um, and it's it's awfully wordy, but I'll take some time to describe it. Um, that that you know, uh, for this is this one's for tangible extinction. So, as an example, if the antecedent was that the child was told to put their toy away at bedtime, and maybe the behavior was that they fell to the ground and started to cry, um, that we would keep that expectation in place. So functional extinction. Um, and also make sure that we were doing doing so with compassion. And so um, the behavioral translation is there kind of on the bottom left. Um, and then and then on the right is the the arbitrary or non-functional reinforcers that might be offered in that moment. So we might um, offer um, just some reassurance of you can do hard things. I believe in you. Um, we might um, empathize a little bit and just say, I'm sorry, you look like you're feeling sad. Um, we might help them label what the source of the frustration is or the EO and just say it's really hard to be all done with your toy. Um, we might offer some non-contingent support. I'm here for you. Uh, maybe offer a hug or a rub on the back or um, maybe some assistance, maybe can we try it together and offer to hold their hand as we go clean up the toy. Um, so still functional extinction, but offering other sources of what uh, what we've seen to be kind or maybe even compassionate if it did um, alleviate some of that distress for the learner in the moment. Um, and then let's get to, how about escape extinction? So same thing. Um, if if it was time for the a child to do the homework and they they um, began to yell or protest, we would still have that expectation in place for functional extinction, um, but but offer some other sources of comfort. Um, so if they want to uh, sit next to me while they do their homework, or um, I just help to like acknowledge what their experience is in that moment. Um, and just help them to validate uh, what what their feelings are and and what the source of upset is. And so what we found was that um, kind extinction, so the procedural variation um, on traditional extinction of offering an arbitrary reinforcer contingent on the target behaviors, um, was that we we still saw a decrease in the target behavior of the, I think it was tantrum behavior and, and some um, aggression, um, similar to what we might see with or might expect with traditional extinction. So we didn't compare the two, um, but we, we evaluated um, if kind extinction would still be effective in decreasing what the target behavior was. And so we found that providing that genuine positive attention and emotional validation contingent on um, the interfering behavior was effective for decreasing that behavior. 
And we reinforced MANS during baseline and during intervention so that there was still a reinforcement component throughout. And we saw that MANS also increased during intervention. And so these results suggest that providing that attention and emotional validation um, may be effective um, for learners in decreasing interfering behavior. Um, and also we did a social validity survey with the staff and with the, the parents um, at the end. And we found that this, the initial evidence was that these pr this procedure was found to be um, acceptable to both caregivers and staff. Um, if we re replicate this in the future, I would um, also want to do a social validity measure with the learners themselves. Um, and so just to really be thinking about social validity, I think um, it just goes hand in hand when we think about what compassion means within behavior analytic practice and thinking about whether the ends justify the means and really to be considering what our clients experiences are and acknowledging that those matter, whether or not we can fit them in a clean box, so an operational definition, like we can observe how our learners are feeling um, and how they're experiencing our interventions, our procedures. Um, and so to make space for that somewhere, whether we're taking data on their like facial expressions during our, when we're implementing our interventions, that's something that we've recently started to do. Um, or, or in other ways, but really just prioritizing what our what the our clients' experiences are overall, and make sure that we're not quick to rationalize short-term distress in the name of potential long-term benefit. And so that's when we talk about extinction. That's often something that's said is that like we need to follow through now so that they learn X, Y, or Z later, um, and that's why it's important. And, and that may be the case, um, and it may not, it may not be necessary. And so I think really considering the short term and the long term benefit and finding that balance is going to help us move toward being a more compassionate um, science and a compassionate practice. And again, not compromising the effectiveness of what we do each day but really committing to being effective while also making our procedures more compassionate. And um, again, back to kind of those, the initial slide that I showed, um, that in considering that maybe creating nurturance and support for our learners, even and maybe especially during the most difficult times is the purpose of what we do in ABA, that we get to show up each day and do our best to teach the learners that we get to work with. Um, and maybe that's our primary responsibility, that like being human can be more important than being scientific. I know like if we should, we don't have to make that choice, but if, if we do in a given moment, um, that's that's the commitment that I have made is that I'm going to be as compassionate as possible. And then we take data, we can evaluate whether or not like we're still being effective. Um, and that maybe how compassionate a procedure is can be viewed as equally important as um, how effective and socially valid that procedure is. Um, some feedback I've gotten uh, since since we've published this article is kind of like a bit of an eye roll of like another new term. Um, really, like, is this going to be another hyphenated part of ABA? Do we need that? Um, and maybe not. That definitely was not the intention that it's not that I, we're not copy, copywriting kind extinction by any means. It doesn't need to be called that. Um, maybe in the future, like that will just be what extinction is. Um, and so, but if we're going to like think technologically, like kind extinction in the way that we implemented it um, is a modified procedure. We were adding something or offering an arbitrary reinforcer contingent on the target behavior. So there is a technological um, difference between what the tr two procedures are, between kind extinction and traditional extinction. Um, I don't think that's the most important part, um, but I do think uh, that if if emphasizing compassion 
in how we talk about our procedures is a way for us to reflect to our learners and maybe to the autistic community that we're prioritizing compassion, um, then maybe I'm OK with a new term um, and maybe it is needed, at least right now, until we have um, moved more toward compassionate practice as as the norm and um, how we're growing our field. And so um, if when we hear criticism of our field, um, we have the opportunity to in how we will respond. And if um, we want to choose to move forward um, by examining and just in adjusting our procedures to be more compassionate without being less effective, then maybe a new term is a way for us to genuinely reflect this commitment. Um, and I and I would say too that that this is just an initial step. Um, many others in our field, as as you all likely know, are um, making the commitment toward moving toward compassion within our um, practice. In there are different ways for how this may look. Um, for sure, the consideration of assent um, and how that's that's now in our ethics code as well. Um, and so let's keep going. Let's let's all commit to moving in this direction. Um, one one other thing that we're working on right now is a decision model um, for minimizing the use of extinction um, period, whether it's kind extinction or traditional, um, and making sure that we're really increasing the use of ascent based practice. Um, and if we determine that we do need extinction, um, then how can we decrease the aversiveness of extinction um, and so that we're ideally seeing less of those side effects that we know can occur when we implement extinction. Um, so we're working on a, a decision model there. Um, and I think that's all I have for you. I talked very fast today, so I actually have uh, qu quite a bit of time for questions or feedback that I that I'd love to hear. Thank you, Courtney. That's really, really useful. Um, guys, send me your questions and I'm more than happy to read them to Courtney. How could kind extinction be implemented for attention maintained behaviors or challenge? Yeah, thank you for that. Um, I think that was P Patricia. Um, so that's yeah, that's usually the first question I get, which uh, which is a great question. Um, and so we need to extend this research. Absolutely. Um, my hunch is that we look at the the quality of of the reinforcement and so um uh briggs and colleagues did a recent study where they looked at um uh whether or not we could be effective without implementing escape extinction specifically um and so looking at and manipulating the quality and the magnitude of reinforcement and so if a behavior safer attention um, it resulted in kind of like a diluted, maybe less exciting form of attention um, for the target behavior. And then the desired replace, replacement behavior may result in like kind of like the, the end all be all, the greatest form of attention. Um, I think I, my, my hunch would be we can get some movement there and that's shown to be the case for um, escape motivated behaviors. Um, but of course, like, you know, uh, for kind extinction, in our study, it was arbitrary, so non-functional reinforcers. Um, but I think that's that's definitely a study that needs to be done. Looking looking at that. Dan saying, fantastic study. It made my heart smile. Can you give some examples of the mans that were occurring during the procedure? Yeah. So these were um, these were little ones. I think they were all four and under, and so their their vocal language uh, was different from learner to learner. Um, so I think um, a lot of them were for the actual item or for um, escape. And so I can't remember if they were asking for a break or or what have you. But if they um, emitted a mand at all, then during baseline as well as during treatment, the mand was reinforced. Um, and also important to note, I don't think I did on that slide, that for uh, escape extinction, we did not use physical guidance. We did more of kind of the, the weighted out sort of escape extinction. Did you get resistance when suggesting recommending this procedure? Um, yeah, great question, Nadia. Um, 
So we, we again, like we completed the treatment evaluation several years ago and it took me a while to get it written up. And so to me, that's been very interesting that um, initially when sharing this, uh, some of the, the hesitation or um, feedback was kind of like, um, are you sure? Like, should we be like adding or offering reinforcers arbitrary or not contingent on the problem behavior? Um, and so some initial resistance, which is then why we, you know, we were careful to take data on it. And I think, you know, if if we were shaping up an attention function, we would have seen that with our data. And that's why we take such careful data that, so we can adjust our procedures along the way. Um, and then more currently, now that um, we've been sharing the the article, now that it's published, it's the the feedback has has really shifted. And so uh, some of the feedback now is um, like, okay, but why aren't you implementing more ascent based procedures first before implementing extinction? Or um, I talked with a, a colleague who who was a bit concerned that that publishing this and kind of having kind and extinction as a, as one term would almost function as sort of a sense of permission for implementing extinction when as a field their hope was that we'd be moving away from sort of assuming that extinction needs to be on every behavior plan and that um, we're exhausting reinforcement based procedures first before considering implementing extinction and so uh I think that those are those are valid, you know, bits of feedback, and it's just been interesting to me how like that feedback has has changed over time as our field has shifted. Strengthening MOs for me work works wonders. We've got a comment. Also, I love the possibility that the phrase and the meaning behind kind of extinction could be generalized to all behavior analysts when approaching extinction in their interventions. Uh, truly wonderful variation, Courtney, kudos. Can you give a few examples of how compassion can potentially be used in other principles of behavior that have been misused? Oh, you're not pulling your pants, Costas. All right. A few examples of how compassion can potentially be used. In other principles misused. of behavior that have been misused. Well, I think so if like, uh, thinking about the definition that's been offered com for compassion, um, uh, that I I think there's no clean rule for how to implement it, and so really thinking about the short term distress and then potentially the long term, and um, how to how to come come at that decision of like if if we're going to sacrifice or um, really commit to minimizing short term distress then might that come at a cost for something in the long term or vice versa? If we're going to like work through something in the short term um, in the hopes that in the long term, this this person will have less distress. And so like um, like I was saying before, kind of that um, default response for extinction of being like, well, we need to like discontinue reinforcement in this moment. So the learner uh, learns that this behavior will not result in this reinforcement anymore um when considering the long term um and and what what that may mean for that learner um and so i think there's potential for misuse in either direction right that if we make kind of the wrong assumption or wrong leap uh when when looking at what compassion may may mean um in misuse i i mentioned it quickly when um going over our procedures but just really making sure that we're thinking about um compassion functionally um and and also individually, so like it it will look differently for each person because everyone has their own um, preferences and and learning history, and so to make sure that we're not assuming that what we intend to be compassionate functions that way for that learner in that moment, because it may not, and just because we intend something to you know function a certain way doesn't mean that's how the learner will experience it. And so I think, again, like just taking data and, and making sure that we're really considering that, whether it's just that it does not escalate the behavior more in the moment, um, or that overall, maybe we're taking data on how often the learner approaches us, that we're functioning as a source of positive reinforcement. Um, like the number one thing I teach the the behavior techs that, that I work with is like, that are the kids should be running toward you, not away from you. And if we're seeing the the latter, that we need to pause everything and make sure that we're really 
um, emphasizing building rapport and that there's um, like ample and um, large sources of positive reinforcement and just evaluating a session and making sure that the majority of behaviors that are occurring are occurring um, uh, with motivation toward um, positive reinforcement rather than motivation toward negative reinforcement. And I just give the second keyword here, guys, so I don't forget the second keyword for your CU is orange, as in the fruit. The second keyword for your CU is orange. Another question for you, Courtney. Have you looked at kind extinction in combination with skill building? For example, teaching the learner you, sp you spoke about who struggled to give up a preferred toy, so teaching them to ask for more play and slowly build their tolerance towards giving this item up. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Clarissa, you sound like you're a fan of uh, skill-based treatment. And so I think um, that this procedure is very, very aligned with Greg Hanley's work with uh, the PFA and skill-based treatment. And that's what your comment sounded like to me is, so if, um, how are we integrating this with skill building so that um, learners are more willing to kind of like do the tough stuff over over time um, and that like that that delay is something that they are uh, more able to tolerate. So, um, and um, I do some work with ACT with young learners as well, and that's a big piece of it, of um, really um, teaching them to orient toward uh, delayed positive reinforcers rather than like short-term immediate negative reinforcement. And so um, for some learners that may be very gradual and then for others um, possibly not, but really thinking about sources of positive reinforcement when we're working on skill building programs as well. Uh, I've got another comment. Uh, I work with teenagers and can see how kind extinction is absolutely key in building and maintaining relationships. Thank you. Um, you're complete, completely right here with SBT. So yes, you, you, you've, you've been pointed correctly, Courtney. Thank you for expanding on the ACT aspect. That's super interesting. Uh, I've got a question that says, would principles of kind extinction also apply when going through extinction bursts? Uh, how could this look in practice? Yeah, and so um, that that's certainly a part that I would love to extend as well. Um, we didn't see any extinction bursts within our treatment evaluation. Of course, this was just with four learners. Um, I also do think it's sort of um, an, an assumption that we work through extinction bursts regularly when if we look at our literature, it's not something that's happening every time extinction is, is implemented. Um, that said, I, I do also think that like that this hopefully would minimize extinction bursts, that if we're like functioning as a non-contingent um, source of positive regard and support and other non-functional reinforcers, um, that we're less likely to see extinction burst, but that's that's definitely an assumption at, at this point and should be and should be looked at. Okay. Other questions, folks. I love the participation. A really lovely study. I'm excited to see where future research goes in terms of determining what compassion means for the particular individual. Were parents or stakeholders spoken to before the study to inform what that meant for each child? Yeah, great question. We we weren't calling it kind extinction um, during or after the study. Um, each of the the kids that were included, um, this was a treatment evaluation, so they were existing clients, and we we just we shifted from using um, traditional extinction to this kind procedural modification of extinction. And so um, we just asked the parents afterward, which which they preferred, um, if they found to be one more effective than the other and, and things like that. I think it was five total questions, so a very quick survey. Um, and then we did the same for our interventionists, our RBTs. Um, and to me, that was a really cool um, finding with this study was that our RBTs um, like much preferred this procedure. We Again, we weren't calling it kind then, and we were just saying like, which one did you like? And they um, 
I think each one of them said, you know, in some way, like, I'm, I'm so glad I get to do this. Thank you. Like, it's so nice to be able to offer support to this, this child when they're showing me that they're upset. Um, and again, to me, that was kind of like a harsh moment of like, gosh, we've, we've been telling you to do otherwise all of this time. Um, and so, uh, what was the, the question spoken oh, to before the study to inform what meant for each child? So, uh, the, the, yeah, the name kind was not there. And then I don't know if you're also getting at or asking, um, the, the forms of, uh, kindness or the, the positive reinforcers that were off offered arbitrarily. Um, and yeah, we, we did, um, we did like a preference assessment as well as reinforcer inventory from the caregivers to give, to get ideas for what may kind of function um, kindly in the moment. Um, and to us, that's why it was important to offer it to not just say like, here's a hug, <laughs> uh, so that, that it was um, based on what the child was, was wanting to accept in that moment. Have you seen any freebies in terms of skills or results from doing this? Um, the person's thinking of uh, things like, did kids maybe learn to ask for reassurance or comfort or start tacting their own feelings independently and so on? Yeah, another great question, Clarissa. Thank you. We um we didn't formally measure it, and that was one of the things afterward that I wished that we had. So just anecdotally, yeah, I think like just their their willingness and like comfortability or like you know what whatever you would like to call it, uh, they were approaching us more to seek out that comfort once they saw that that was something that was being offered. And like, how cool is that? If we can function in that way for our learners, that even when they're up, upset with something that we're asking them to do, that they're also seeking comfort for us in that moment. Another comment says, amazing study. As ABA is moving to more ascent-based practice, would you do this in conjunction with kind escape uh, extinction dependent on the target behaviors? Yeah, uh, thanks for that question, Stephen. Um, so that's the decision model that I mentioned at the end, which I thought I wouldn't have time to present, but now I, I talked so quickly, I could have thrown that in there in a couple of slides. Um, so that's something uh, that I've been working on developing, um, you know, in 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 uh, response to some of the feedback that I thought a lot about with this study of. Um, really making sure that this is not kind of just making it more comfortable for us as practitioners to include extinction in our behavior plans, but really be um, considering if, if it needs to be there in the first place. And maybe it's our responsibility to exhaust reinforcement um, procedures solely first before we include extinction. And so that's, that's what our decision model is getting at is, um, uh, ascent based practice. And so looking at the Bro Smith article uh, of ascent on, on ascent um, and, and building off of what they gave us for a choice model. Um, but really, it starts with like in that moment, reinforcing ascent withdrawal, period, unless there is um, like, you know, if it's a safety concern or health concern um, or impeding upon another person's boundaries, et cetera. Um, and, and it wasn't intended this way. I wish that I could say it was, but if I if you, if we reflect on the procedure of kind extinction, when we take a moment to validate the learner's experience and like offer them a hug, um, that functionally we are reinforcing ascent withdrawal there. Maybe it's super briefly, um, and especially if we're implementing escape extinction, but just that those, you know, few moments of offering them a hug, there's also some escape happening there, you know, temporarily. And so um, to me, that's that's where I'm at as a practitioner is um, uh, reinforcing ascent withdrawal to some degree. And then, ha and then that degree would depend on the overall context and what's being considered. And um, we're classifying sort of the, um, demand because for ascent withdrawal, we're talking about escape motivated behaviors. And so we're trying to classify uh, whether or not the demand itself is necessary or maybe um, maybe not so necessary. And it's something that we could come back to the next day or change how we're asking it and things like that. And so really putting more of the responsibility on us as the practitioners rather than the learner 
um, so that we're not just teaching compliance period, but that we're like having a contextual science and how we're uh, applying it. And it and that should include um, the context of the demands that we're presenting and whether or not they're necessary. And if they are, can we present them a bit more flexibly or a bit more um, preferred so that the learner is more likely to do what's being asked? That is amazing. Thank you so much. That is really, really cool that you have seen these changes. That is a comment from the previous answer that we provided, Courtney, on the freebies and uh, the spillover learning effects. Any other questions, folks? That's good engagement today. We've broken record for sure with how many questions we've had asked. So you're 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 drawing attention with your work, Courtney. That's for sure. Well, good. And, and I guess it's uh, something to leaving space for the questions, which I unintentionally left so much time. So I, I appreciate the engagement. That's all, right. <laughs> that's all right. It's great. Yes, we, I think we're benefiting massively from this um, discussion. OK, let me let me ask you one then. Why do you think it's taken us so long mm. as a field to get there? Mm. You know, well, I think that uh, Dr. Linehan touched on this this last month. I I, did, I haven't caught the full the full episode, but I caught parts. And the more I learn about ascent, and then um, in particular the constructional approach, um, it it has always been there um, as part of our science. Um, and and Skinner talked a lot about this that like to make sure that like coercive control is is not um, like the basis of of what we're doing and how we're getting at behavior change. Um, and then somewhere along the way, uh, we, we kind of dropped some of that. And I think, you know, um, with like discrete trial and um, those kind of gaining a lot of traction early on who like weren't necessarily behavior analysts, um, but we see we saw how effective that could be. Um, but I think we, we sacrificed um, like that that foundation of um, trust and safety and positive rapport. Um, and so I think we're we're just at a point in our field where we're seeing like we don't need to sacrifice that. And when in fact, we need to commit to making sure that that is the foundation from which we're we're teaching. Um, and honestly, I think that uh, we're being held accountable now by a lot of those learners who experienced maybe the less kind version of of our, the application um, and are now telling us what their experiences were. And so like, it's, I think, our time to make sure that we're listening and incorporating a lot of that feedback. Good, thank you, thank you for that. Okay, folks, your last keyword for today is going to be dog, as in the animal, the last, yeah, a bit random, but what, why not? Dog, <laughs> the last keyword is dog. Uh, I, I'll tell you why, Courtney, because uh, some of my regulars have started seeing the pattern that I make the words as I go, and it's based <laughs> on the presentation. So I worry that eventually they're going to start reading my mind and figure, uh. figure out the keywords in advance. So I'm starting to throw some random ones in there just to guard, <laughs> just to guard against that. <laughs> because they're, like uh, they're reading me like an open book now. <laughs> All right, I've got um, a final question. Uh, your decision model, where will be, where will we be able to hear more about this? Um, if you uh, if you want to shoot me an email, Clarissa, and I'll send the slides out as well. I'll get those to Thanos, um, uh, and I'm I'm happy to share it. We want to evaluate it, and I think it's like I think it has some more developing to do. I'm not quite uh, pleased with it's a little bit too complicated when we're talking about in the moment decision making, um, and so. But I'm I'm happy to share with what I've come up with so far. So yeah, send send me an email, and I'm happy to share. Okay. All right. Well, Orton, thank you so thank much. You this is a lot of fun. <laughs> it's It's been very valuable and uh, I'm sure colleagues have taken away a lot of things that they can take forward with their work. And guys, this is going to be on our YouTube channel. If you go on YouTube and you just type Tizard Center, our channel should come up and we upload the recording. So if you want to revisit this or if you want to share it with colleagues uh, or other stakeholders that they might want to listen to the discussions, by all means, please do so. Let me put in the chat now the link to the CEU form. So this is where you go to uh, submit your CEUs. And I would also like to put the uh, feedback form so we can get some feedback 
from you guys about our session. Courtney, I think you are seeing the chat, so I can I hopefully yeah, you're seeing all thank the thank you yous all. and everything. <laughs> so guys, I've added the two links. Hopefully you can see them. One of them is the feedback form and the other is the CU uh, form. OK, so hopefully that works OK for you. Please click on them before we conclude, because once I shut down the meeting, you're not going to have access to the chat. OK, so make sure they're in your browser. Hopefully we will have you back in the future, Courtney, to talk more about your lovely work. I'm sure colleagues would uh, enjoy it. Thank you again for joining us and thank you guys for being such a great audience as always. Uh, and uh, I will see you all soon. CEUs, give me give me a month and I'll prep them. Please don't email me saying where's my CEU in three days. Don't be too strict on me. I've got a heavy workload. OK, so bear with. I will get to them. All right. Thank you all. Thank Have you a good so one. much. Bye bye.